Another type of epithelial tissues that we have been discussing was the pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium. And if you remember, this is the type of epithelium that gives me an impression that I'm looking at more than once a layer because of the arrangement of the nuclei. So I am about to say it's stratified, but when I look at the shape of the apical cells, you're going to figure out that this is a columnar cell. So if you remember, it's not logical to have a columnar cell at the apex of an epithelial tissue. And this simply because the epithelium is avascular. So in order for it to get its nutrients and oxygen, the fluid needs to travel up to your basal cells first and then all the way to the apical cells. So the cells that will be getting the least amount of fluids containing the oxygen and nutrients, those are going to be the apical cells. So it's not logical to have those large columnar cells at the apex in a stratified epithelium. So what we figured out is that all the cells are actually attached to the basement membrane. So this simply means I have one cell layer, but because the cells are so crowded in the tissue, so it's, give, it's given me just a false impression that I'm looking at a stratified epithelium. So we decided to not call it a stratified or a simple epithelium, but we called it a pseudo-stratified epithelium. Pseudo means a false or fake stratified. If you remember, pseudo-stratified columnar ciliated epithelium did contain those large vacuolated cells. Those are my goblet cells cells or my mucus cells and they will be responsible for the production of the mucus also as you see on here on top of those apical cells i have the cilia or those hair like uh, projections coming out they will be responsible to allow the propulsion of the mucus that gets released from the mucus or goblet cells we mainly going to be finding this pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium in most of the upper respiratory tract and the trach. Moving on to another type of epithelium that we've seen was the stratified squamous epithelium. Remember, I have many cell layers and the top cells are flat. So this is going to be a stratified squamous epithelium. Remember, that I have two varieties of the stratified squamous epithelium. I have the keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and the non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Looking here at another slide that shows the stratified squamous epithelium. It's not clear on here. This slide is not that clear for a transitional epithelium. So don't expect to see a slide like this one on your test. Looking closer also at other slides that are showing the stratified squamous epithelium. Again, many cell layers, many cell layers. This is a stratified epithelium and apical cells are flat cells, squamous. Apical cells are flat, as you see on here. So stratified squamous epithelium. Again, is this keratinized or non-keratinized? I don't see any layers of fibers on top of my living cells. So it's a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium that I can see on here. From the appearance of the tissue, what do you expect the function of this epithelium to be? This epithelium is trying to form as many cell layers as possible. So the main function on here for this epithelium is going to be to protect the underlying tissues. It's very important, very important to remember that its main function is to allow the protection of the underlying tissues in areas subject to abrasion. And three sites that we can find the non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium in. Those are going to be the oral cavity, the mouth, 
the esophagus and the vagina. Where can I see keratinized stratified squamous epithelium where I have this extra layer of fibers on top of my cells? It's going to be in my epidermis of the skin. Epidermis, this is the outermost layer of my skin and it makes perfect sense. I have extra layer of protection in the site where I need the highest protection possible, which is my skin. It's exposed to the outside. I need the highest possible protection. Moving on to another type of epithelium, I can see here many cell layers, so I'm about to say it's stratified, but when I look at the shape of the apical cells, apical cells look cuboidal in shape, but some of them are actually squamous, some of them are flat. So are, would I consider this as a stratified cuboidal, would I consider this as a stratified squamous? We need to have a look back at the location for this type of epithelium. This type of epithelium is located in the urinary tract, in the ureters, urinary bladder, and urethra. And the main function here is to allow the stretch and the distension of the urinary organs to accommodate the urine. So this is a type of epithelium that allows you to stretch the cells, and this will be causing the transformation of those cuboidal cells into squamous cells. Moving on to another type of tissue that we have seen, it's a type of connective tissue where I can find those collagen fibers, and those thin, darkly stained, long fibers, those are my elastic fibers, and I have a lot of spaces in between. This is a, the areolar connective tissue. The areolar connective tissue, it's going to be allowing the fluid to travel up to the epithelium. So it's going to be widely distributed under the epithelia of the body. Looking at another type of loose connective tissue that we have been discussing, it's the adipose connective tissue. And as you see on here, these cells are large, empty, vacuolated. The nuclei are compressed towards the peripheral parts of the cell. Those cells are the fat cells, and they occupy most of the size of the adipose connective tissue. The main function of the adipose connective tissue is to reserve energy in the form of fat. Any extra energy intake that we have gets transformed into either glycogen in the liver and skeletal muscle cells or as triglycerides or neutral fat in the adipose tissue cells. It's also going to allow the insulation of the body against heat loss. So it preserves the heat in the body, allowing some support and protection to the body organs. It's widely distributed under the skin in the hypodermis. It's below the skin, around the kidney, other abdominal organs as well, and in the breast. Looking here, another diagram or another slide that is showing those adipocytes or fat cells. And those are the large vacuoles that were occupied by the stored fat. Moving on to another type of connective tissue, it's the cartilage. If you remember, a major characteristic that we rely on to identify the, the cartilage from other types of connective tissue is the presence of the chondrocytes within their spaces, chondrocytes within lacuni. In order for me to differentiate the different types of cartilage from one another, we rely on the type of fibers located in the matrix around those chondrocytes. So if I see chondrocytes within spaces, chondrocytes in lacony, this is a cartilage. When I look at the matrix around the chondrocytes in lacony, 
if I couldn't see, I can't see here any fibers. I can't see any fibers in the matrix. The matrix has a homogeneous consistency. If you remember from our discussions in class, it's going to be the hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is going to be responsible to support, reinforces, and, and provides resistance against compressive stress. It's going to be widely distributed in areas related to the respiratory system, like your nose, in the forming the nasal cartilages, the trachea, the larynx, the uh, coastal cartilages that are attaching the ribs to the sternum. Also, they will the hyaline cartilage covers the articular surfaces of the bones of the synovial joints. So any two bones that are articulating with one another, they are covered with hyaline cartilage on here, and this will prevent the articulation of a bone against another bone directly because cartilage is simply an avascular tissue. So it's not going to have an inflammation taking place because of the recurrent irritation while you are moving your joints. If I did have two bones articulating directly against one another, because the bone tissue is vascularized, it contains blood vessels, so it's going to get inflamed, and it's going to be much difficult to move your joints. Another type of cartilage, again, how do we identify the cartilage tissue from other tissues is the presence of chondrocytes within spaces, as you see on here, chondrocytes within the space, the space around the chondrocytes, again, it's my lacuna, and the plural noun is lacunae. What is the main characteristics that I would rely on, again, in order to differentiate the different types of cartilage is the type of fibers located in the matrix. If you see closely on here, you can see those thin, darkly stained long fibers. How would you tell that those are thin fibers, not thick fibers? Compare the diameter, again, of the fiber to the diameter of a nearby cell. If I have a small diameter, I have a thin fiber on here is going to have a very small diameter compared to the diameter of the cell. So what did we call those thin, darkly stained long fibers? Those are my elastic fibers. So if I have a cartilage with elastic fibers, this is what we call the elastic cartilage. Elastic cartilage is going to allow you to maintain the shape of the structure, like your ear penna, your epiglottis, while providing them with great flexibility. Another type of cartilage that we have on here, again, we identify the cartilage by looking at those cells surrounded by a space, chondrocytes in lacunae. And in order for me to differentiate the different types of cartilage from one another, I look at the type of fibers in the matrix. And when I look at the type of fibers on here, I see Th very thick bundles of fibers traveling across the cartilage. Those thick bundles of fibers, if you remember, those are the collagen fibers. Collagen fibers are thick bundles of fibers, and the type of cartilage that has extra collagen fibers in it, it's a cartilage that has extra fibers, so we call this as my fibro cartilage. And why would you like to add extra fibers in the cartilage? Because this type of cartilage is going to allow higher tensile strength and it allows it to absorb much greater compressive shock. So where in your body do you have a lot of compressive shock applied? If you think of it, you will find that 
you are applying a lot of compression on your spine. So a lot of compressive shock gonna be applied between your vertebrae. So I need this type of cartilage to be located between the vertebrae in my intervertebral discs. Also, I will be applying lots of compression in the knee joint. So I will have located between the femur and the tibia, I would have the right and left on the le right and left sides. Actually, we don't call it right and left. It's going to be the medial and lateral sides. So on both sides, between the femur and the tibia, we're going to have the menisci on here located to absorb the compression applied by the femur on the tibia. Also another location for the fibrocartilage is going to be the symphysis pubis or the pubic symphysis and it's going to be the joint located between the two pubic bones in the pelvis. So if we're looking here those are the two pubic bones meeting to, together, the anterior aspect of the pelvis. The attachment on here between the two pubic bones, it's going to be formed by fibrocartilage. So we call the joint here between the two pubic bones articulating to one another, it's going to be the symphysis pubis or the pubic symphysis. Another diagram on here that is showing the three different types of cartilage. Again, chondrocytes and lacony cartilage. Homogeneous consistency of the matrix. This tells me I'm looking at a hyaline cartilage. Here, it's not that clear. This slide is not a typical slide, so don't expect to see something like this on your exam. But you can see on here, chondrocytes and lacony, and I have thin fibers located in between the chondrocytes again. This is not that clear, so don't expect this slide on your test. A much better looking slide on here, hiding cartilage. Hiding cartilage is very, very, very characteristic appearance. I don't see much fibers between the chondrocytes as you see on here. Here I have those fibers between the chondrocytes in lacony and I if I compare the diameter of the fibers if I compare the diameter of the fibers on here to the diameter of a chondrocyte I have a much smaller diameter than the diameter of a chondrocyte so this tells me I'm looking at elastic fibers in a cartilage so this is an elastic cartilage Looking on here, I see chondrocytes again in lacony. This tells me I'm looking at a cartilage. When I look at the matrix, I can see thick bundles of fibers traveling. Those are my collagen fibers. So if you see extra collagen fibers within a cartilage, it's a fibro cartilage. All right, so those, those slides are much better looking compared to those three. So you're more likely to see those on your exams than the previous ones. Looking on here, another very good looking slide. Chondrocytes in lacony, chondrocytes in spaces. When I look at the matrix, I see, do you see any fibers on here? Yes, definitely. Many fibers. And what kind of fibers? Are those thick bundles or thin, darkly stained, long fibers? thin dark stained long fibers those are my elastic fibers and elastic fibers are going to be located in what kind of cartilage again it's my elastic elastic cartilage all right how about this one chondrocytes in lacony chondrocytes in a space this tells me i'm looking at cartilage see fibers in the matrix yes are those 
thin, directly stained lung fibers, or those are thick bundles of fibers? If the answer is th thick bundles of fibers, those are my collagen fibers. And what kind of cartilage do you have? Collagen, extra collagen fibers located in the, its matrix. It's gonna be my fibro cartilage. Those are two very important slides. They are so clear to identify. Looking at another type of connective tissue, it's going to be the bone tissue or osseous tissue. Very characteristic appearance. The building blocks of the bone tissue are what we call the osteons. Osteons are going to have those central canals where the blood vessels are going to be traveling. Surrounding those central canals, we're going to have layers of bone because those are the lamellae. And embedded between those layers of bone, we can see tiny little spaces, the lacony, where I keep the bone cells, the mature bone cells, or what we call the osteocytes. So again, again, what we're looking at in here, we're looking at the osseous tissue, very characteristic appearance. It looks as if it, you're looking at a transverse section in a tree. It's going to be located within your bones and it's gonna uh, act which gonna act as levers for the muscles to act on allow a locomotion also bone tissue allows you to store calcium and other very important minerals as well as fat like in the shaft of your long bones as we're gonna learn later on in our discussions of the skeletal system also, it allows the formation of all the blood form elements, including the red blood cells. And this is due to the presence of the red bone marrow within your bones. Moving on to another type of connective tissue that we have discussed, it's going to be the blood. And why do we consider the blood as a connective tissue? Although you don't see any kind of fibers within it simply because the there is fibers within the blood but those fibers are soluble so they are soluble they only become insoluble once you activate them once you activate the fibrinogen it becomes fibrin and this fibrin will actually allow you to form the blood clot all right, so yes, I do have fibers, but they are soluble. That's why I consider it as a type of connective tissue. What can we see on here? We can see those rounded reddish cells that have clear, darker periphery and light colored centers. Those are my red blood cells or erythrocytes. What's erythro? Erythro means red and site is cell. Erythrocytes or red blood cells. Another type of blood cells that we can see on here on the slide, it's a type of white blood cells. White blood cells are nucleated. This is a specific type of white blood cells. It has a segmented nucleus and granules in the cytoplasm. This is what we call the neutrophil. It's one of the most common types of your white blood cells. And other names that we give to the white blood cells are my leukocytes. Leuco means white, site means cells. The blood is going to be responsible to transport the respiratory gases, nutrients, wastes, in and out of your organs. 
a laser diagram here, a laser slide that is shown the blood tissue. Again, as we've agreed, as we've seen in the previous slide, those rounded cells with dark periphery pale centers, those are my erythrocytes or my red blood cells. Another type of white blood cells that you can see on here is a, a, a type of white blood cells that has a dark large nucleus occupying uh, around 80% or more of the size of the cell. Those are highly active cells. That's why they require this dark large nucleus to be present. Those highly active white blood cells are what we call the lymphocytes. And we call them lymphocytes because we, they are located in large quantities in the lymphoid organs. Moving on to the different types of muscle tissue. If you see on here, I have cylindrical shaped cells. Each cell has more than one nucleus and it is striated so it has dark lines throughout the length of the muscle cell. This is my skeletal muscle tissue. Also cylindrical cells, they are nucleated but a very characteristic appearance here for those cells is that the cells are branching. If I see branching cells, this tells me that it's a cardiac muscle tissue. So looking here, as a cardiac muscle tissue, we see clearly cells are branching. Branching. They are striated, they are cylindrical, and they have dark connections here between the cells and we call those dark connections between the cells of the cardiac muscle tissue those are my intercalated discs a very characteristic appearance here of the cardiac muscle tissue again cells are branching and located between the cells you see on here those dark lines that would serve as uh, intercellular junctions. Those are my intercalated discs. Where can you find the cardiac muscle tissue? Cardiac muscle tissue is gonna be located in the wall of the ventricles of the heart. And it's gonna be under involuntary control. So you don't have any voluntary control on how strong your cardiac muscle cells will be contracting or on how fast your cardiac muscle cells will be contract. All right, so cardiac muscle contraction, it's under involuntary control. Its main function is to pump the blood out to reach all the different organs of your body. You can hear Cylindrical shape, again, occupying the whole tissue. Striated cells have those dark bands on here, as you see. Alternating with light bands. Each cell has more than one nucleus. I'm multi-nucleated. Here, it's the skeletal muscle tissue. And skeletal muscle tissue is gonna be forming your skeletal muscles along with other types, other connective tissue. The skeletal muscles are gonna be responsible for locomotion, voluntary movement, allowing you to manipulate your environment, but also they are attached to the skin. So they are going to be allowing you to have facial expressions. Remember, skeletal muscle tissue is under voluntary control. Smooth muscle tissue, what we're looking at in here, those are those unstriated spindle-shaped muscle cells, which are mononucleated. So each 
muscle cell has its own nucleus, has a single nucleus, and it has this spindle shaped appearance. And it has no striations, unlike the skeletal muscle tissue, unlike my cardiac muscle tissue. So both cardiac muscle tissue and skeletal muscle tissue have striations, but the smooth muscle tissue doesn't have any striations. Very, very characteristic appearance on here. Spindle-shaped cells, they are not striated. They are mononucleated, so each cell has a single nucleus. Unlike the skeletal muscle tissue, for example, the muscle fibers or the muscle cells of the skeletal muscle tissue contain more than one nucleus. They are multi nucleated. Smooth muscle tissue is under involuntary control. It's going to be dis widely distributed in the body. It's going to be located in the wall of all hollow organs that contain muscles. Like what is a hollow organ again? A hollow organ, it's an organ that has a cavity or a lumen inside. A cavity inside, like what? Like your stomach, for example, your esophagus, your small intestine, your gallbladder, your urinary bladder, ureters, urethra, your blood vessels, your bronchi, all those are organs that have lumen inside, they have cavity inside. So those are all hollow organs and what kind of muscle do i have in here in those hollow organs those are, this is going to be my smooth muscle tissue looking at here at the three different types of muscle tissue three different types of muscle tissue skeletal muscle tissue is a here smooth muscle tissue b and the one with branching cells on here is this going to be my cardiac muscle tissue. Another type of tissues that we have been discussing in our sessions, it's going to be the one that contains those cells with long processes coming out. If you remember, those cells are very characteristic to appear in the nervous tissue. This is how the nerve cells are going to look like. The neurons or the nerve cells, they have a cell body. And this cell body is where it keeps its nucleus. Coming out from the cell body, you're going to have short tapering processes coming out like this those are called the dendrites and long processes coming out from the cell body or the soma those long processes are called the axon a long process is coming out here from the cell body of the neuron again we call this as my axon that has terminal ends we call this as the telodendria we're going to discuss this in much more details when we discuss the nervous system file but for now what you need to know is that those cells with many processes coming out those are my nerve cells or neurons they are not the only cells that will be forming the nervous tissue. You have other cells, as you see here. Those are the glial cells or the neuroglial cells, and those are supporting cells. Their main function is to support the activity of the neurons or the nerve cells. Another example on here on how your nervous tissue looks like those cells with processes coming out those are the neurons and the cells in the background on here if you get closer you will see their nuclei those are the supporting cells or the glial 
glial cells, neuroglial cells. All right, so moving on to the structure of the skin. Skin is formed of three main layers. Let me draw this here. Three main layers that are building the skin. We have the outermost layer of the skin. This is called the epidermis. And if you remember, the epidermis is formed of many cell layers, and the top cells are squamous in shape. I am formed here by the keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Many cell layers, apical cells, as you see on here, those are flat in shape and on top of them I have those keratinized plasma membranes of the dead cells so again again this is my wet layer of the skin the outermost layer it's called the epidermis epidermis And this is going to be the basement membrane on here. Underneath the epidermis, we're going to have the second layer of the skin. This is going to be my dermis. And the dermis is going to be subdivided into two smaller layers. The outermost of them, it's going to be the papillary layer, and it's called so because it has those papillaries, those elevations up in here. And this is actually where the blood vessels and nerve endings are going to be located. And the papillary layer here, it's going to be formed but by what type of connective tissue, if you remember, the type of connective tissue that allows the fluids to travel up to my epithelium, this is what we call the areolar connective tissue. So the very, the very first layer of the dermis is going to be the papillary layer and again it's going to be formed by areolar connective tissue if you remember underneath the papillary layer we've got the reticular layer and if you remember another type of connective tissues that we've discussed in class that is located in the dermis of the skin was the dense irregular connective tissue dense irregular connective tissue those are the two layers again of my dermis underneath the dermis below the skin you're going to have those large vacuolated cells remember forming the adipose tissue this is going to be the third layer which is located underneath the skin here this is my hypodermis hypodermis is formed by adipose connective tissue. In the skin, in the dermis, we're going to have many of the skin appendage, appendages, like, for example, the hair follicles. 
which are going to be located on here and inside we're going to have the root of the hair the shaft of the hair is coming out and in the lower end we're going to have the nerve fibers that will be conducting light touch sensation this is a hair coming out from the skin we do have types of sweat glands we have two types of sweat glands a type that would be releasing watery secretions this is the eccrine sweat glands which is going to be widely distributed in the body and this is how they look like the zermelia secretion is going to be watery another type of sweat glands are the epocrine glands epocrine glands and those are going to be responding not on, not only to the temperature but also to sexual arousal and other emotional factors another type of glands that we can see in the dermis of the skin would be those oil glands or the sebaceous glands and their main function is to release the oils that's going to be covering the shaft of the skin uh, the shaft of the hair i'm sorry and the outer layer the outer layer of the skin i know what's going on here so stay away from the title all right we're gonna see also the pacineal corpuscles which are the nerve receptors in the skin responsible to detect cutaneous sensations as you see on here so this is the pacineal corpuscle this would be the eccrine sweat gland you see on here associated with the hair follicle we've got the sebaceous gland or the oil gland also attached to the hair follicle we can see the erector pili muscle the erector pili muscle are the muscles that when contracted they will cause the erection of the of the hair giving you goose skin again again three layers that you see on here epidermis the dermis and hypodermis this is one of the most important diagrams here for the skin another important diagram for the skin is going to be this one on here showing the same exact structures that we've seen in the previous diagram we see the eccrine sweat gland we see the pacineal corpuscles we see the adipose tissue which is located in the hypodermis we see the reticular layer of the dermis in the reticular layer it's the main layer of the dermis that is representing around 80 percent of the thickness of the dermis so all this is my reticular layer of the dermis until i get to the hypodermis until i reach the hypodermis i can see the apocrine glands number five see how big are the apocrine glands compared to the eccrine sweat glands sebaceous glands as we've seen sebaceous glands also are associated with the hair follicle and their main function is to produce the oil or the sebum that will be covering the shaft of the hair as well as the outer surface of the skin providing you with some kind of waterproof layer Meisner corpuscles. Meisner's are other cutaneous receptors. 
hair shafts, of course, on here. Erector pili muscle, it is going to be the muscle that will be attached to the hair follicle, and when contracted, it's going to cause the erection of the hair. Outermost layer of the skin, which is formed by the keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, this is going to be my epidermis. And the lower the part on here, the very lowest part of the hair located inside the hair follicle is going to be the hair root. So again, again, for the skin, you need to know all the labels on, those, on this diagram, also on this diagram. Other diagrams for the skin are not that important. They are covering the same exact information and you don't have to worry about them. They are just pictures of the actual models that you have on campus. So you don't have to worry about those ones. Just focus mainly on those two. Skin structure model here and the figure from your textbook. Those are the two main diagrams that you should be expecting on your upcoming lab exam. All right, so this completes our discussion for today. I hope this review is going to be helpful. Please let me know if you've got any questions by sending me a message on Canvas. Thank you so much.